Welcome to season two of The Great Humbling. My name's Dougal Hine. I'm a writer and co-founder of a school called Home. Through the strange spring of 2020, I kept a weekly appointment with the futurist Ed Gillespie, where we would puzzle our way through the stories taking shape around the pandemic and how all this fits into a longer arc of social, political and ecological crisis. We called these conversations The Great Humbling because we started from a sense that this is a time of being humbled, brought down to earth, and we wanted to ask what happens if we approach the moment we're in on those terms. Now we're back for a second season, where each week we'll be taking a state of mind that seems to be part of the mix of being alive just now. So this is The Great Humbling Season 2, Altered States. States of being, states of consciousness, and of course, the literal alteration of our nation states. Thanks for listening. Here we are at episode four, approaching the halfway point of this second series, which, since we record these generally on a Tuesday, means right now there is four weeks to go until the American presidential elections. I'm sure we will end up talking about that at some point within the next four weeks. But what kind of state are we in this week? Well, I feel like I need to draw out the suspense. We should have shivering violins or the kind of ominous two-note bass line that makes you think there's a shark attack on the way because just when you thought it was safe to get back in the water here we are in a state of tension how tense are you today ed are you uh are you in need of a massage <laughs> well i think that that goes as goes as red i think every day um yes no i'm uh i'm i'm relaxed but yes feeling taut i think with the uh yeah experiencing a state of tension definitely and that's not just because i'm juggling many things but uh yes i I can feel uh the tautness well in among all of the things you've been juggling what have you been reading or otherwise taking in this week that's been getting you thinking So I've just started um, The Precipice, um, Existential Risk and the Future of Humanity by Toby Ord. Another bit of uh, light reading. Uh, He's a moral philosopher at Oxford University, described as today's Carl Sagan. Uh, And the book's all about how we're essentially standing on the edge of a precipice after the long road of human history so far. Uh, And we're facing obviously multiple risks and, and how we reckon with and resolve them or not will not only define the legacy of the hundred or so billion of our ancestors, but shape the future for the trillions who may yet get to be, or not. Well, that that certainly sounds like intense reading, if you'll forgive the uh, <laughs> the play on words. Actually, you're talking about the, you know, the long road of human history. I've been revisiting The Road by Cormac McCarthy recently for an essay that I'm writing. Well, that's kind of one of these existential risks books taking place in the aftermath of some not fully specified event that has potentially derailed the world forever. Um, It's often cited in conversations about climate fiction, which is interesting given that there's nothing really that suggests that climate change is what's going on in the world of the road but maybe that highlights actually one of the strange things about climate change as an existential threat compared to the sort of mutually assured destruction that hung over the world of well certainly the world of my childhood I would presume the the world of your childhood as well Ed I mean did you grow up reading Zed for Zachariah, Robert Swindle's Brother in the Land, those kinds of uh, jolly bits of bedtime reading. 
Um, not quite. I mean, I, I did. I read the road in one go on a very long Mexican bus journey, and that was a sobering trip in uh, in all senses. But no, actually, I don't think I was raised so much on that sort of dystopian thinking. Although I was an avid reader of the comic 2000 AD, which seems so quaintly titled in hindsight, and uh, I think that was very influential on me um, in how to think about the future, not just the sort of obvious megacity stuff of Judge Dredd, but Rogue tro- Trooper and Chemical Warfare, Sam Slay and robots and AI and tank girl at all um and I think they're all quite far-sighted and, and pressing in many ways about future threats well this is what made you a futurist isn't it Ed? <laughs> see I only discovered the joy of comics when I was in my 30s really and started to get into Alan Moore and uh yeah uh, the Invisibles Grant Morrison all of this stuff funny thing is it's not like I was being sort of brought up by survivalists or anything but <laughs> Just on the, the shelves of Cockerton Branch Library in Darlington 30 years ago, the, the whole kind of young adult section was dominated by these kind of books, whether it's the ones I mentioned before about a nuclear holocaust or oh, there was a book I remember called Noah's Castle by John Rowe Townsend that was, was written in the, the 70s. And it's sort of about an economic depression and hoarding food and all of this. I was having this conversation with um, Dan Thompson from the Empty Shops Network on Facebook. There just clearly was this sense that teenagers needed to read about doom in late 1980s Britain, (laughs) I guess. (laughs) Yeah, I, I certainly lapped it up. So what made me want to talk about a state of tension this week was actually a comment that I got picking up on that article that I quoted from... Phoebe Tickell last week, you remember there was the bit about uh, getting sick with how desperately you want to change the world and trapped in dissociated loops of pseudo change. I got a heartfelt comment on that from my old comrade, Dan Ulner, who I used to be alongside in anti-globalisation groups and we are part of a squatted social centre in Sheffield about 15 years ago. And he wrote, this article is still playing on my mind. It's been crossing over with my own thoughts recently. I'm stuck in a binary commit or give up mental state that I'm finding hard to shake. I'm reading Paul Behrens, brilliant, the best of times, the worst of times. And I've been reminded of the simply impossible cliff we're trying to scale. I'm failing to find any middle ground between I have to devote myself to this with a monkish absolutism or... The world is too huge. It will do its thing. Might as well live a life and stop worrying. I genuinely don't know what to do at this point. I would like the answer not to just be fret about it ineffectually for 50 years, and then die. <laughs> so that's the tension I want to talk about. Because I, I have a feeling that Dan has sort of put into words very honestly something that you know a lot of us come to at least periodically. And it's this, the double bind of can't commit and can't give up being torn between what seems needed and what you're able to believe in. And I guess I want to ask what helps when we do get stuck in that particular kind of tension. Because for one thing, I often don't find the kind of big picture account that Paul Barron is giving in that book that Dan is talking about that helpful. It's not to say that we don't need those kinds of zoomed out perspective, but I know I find I need to balance it with voices that that straddle different scales. And so when I read Dan's comment, I wrote back to him with just three starting points of things that I'm finding helpful just now. One of them is Chris Smage's blog, Small Farm Future. And there's something about the combination of hands-on farming with the training of a social scientist that gives him a particular grip on things. Because I read stuff about how precarious the global food system is that's written by people who you know, don't have dirt under their fingernails, so to speak. And I have this suspicion that given that 99% of all of the agriculture research is done on the industrial agriculture system, And given that only 30% of the world's food supply is actually coming out of the industrial agriculture system, which is an extraordinary 
figure, and we'll put the reference for that in the, the show notes, that there may be things missing from the picture and the sense of possibility of some of the most apocalyptic readings of where we stand with food that are more on the radar of somebody like Chris or like the, the Hodmodods guys who are uh, from your part of the world, Ed. Yeah. So that's one, Small Farm Future. And there's a book coming out that Chris has done growing out of that blog. Then there's, you know, I've talked about this in previous weeks, but the voices brought together by the gesturing towards Decolonial Futures Collective and particularly their contribution to that open democracy debate around deep adaptation with just the reminder of how the narrative of a trajectory of civilizational progress threatened by climate change looks from elsewhere. The, the thing that's being set up when we hear the big story of, you know, here are all the things we've achieved on the ground road of human history. And now we're either going to make the leap over this current set of crises or it's all over. That story does not fit the realities of you know, huge numbers of people in other parts of the world who see the grand story of civilization very differently from where they're sitting. And then sort of leading on from that, there's a line from Tyson Junker Porter, this Australian Aboriginal writer and thinker whose book, Sand Talk, I literally started reading this morning because one of the members of the group that gets together monthly with a school called Home on our call last week quoted this line from Tyson Junker Porter where he's talking about you know, us being in the early years of a thousand year undertaking, because that's how long it will take for the old growth forests to return. And I find it helpful to be reminded of our smallness within the scale of things as a counterweight to the kind of paralyzing messages that place all the weight of the future on the shoulders of those of us who happen to be alive just now and the decisions we make and the actions we take in the next few years. And there's, there's other people I could add to the list. Bio Akamalafe comes to mind. But somewhere in that kind of company, I find that I managed to slip the commit or give up tension that Dan and Phoebe are describing, or at least to, to slip it for a while. Yeah, I guess that's, that's sort of, that's as far as I got to with a starting point of an answer. It's funny, Tyson Junker Porter's sound talk has just arrived on my desk too. I'd seen a ringing endorsement for it by an acquaintance who basically said as soon as she'd finished it, she started reading it again. And there really aren't that many books that ever seem to have that effect on you, even ones I really love. And in the context of his notion of a thousand year undertaking to regrow old forests, there's nothing more humbling than an ancient tree. I remember embracing a relatively young four or five hundred year old cowrie tree sapling that was already four metres in diameter when I was on my flight free global circumnavigation in New Zealand. And cowrie trees are truly ancient giants. You know, they're second only to the sequoia for the title of the world's mightiest tree. They've got their ancestral roots in the Jurassic around 150 million years ago, and they grow up to 50 metres high, 20 metres in girth and live for up to two millennia. And they once dominated the forests of the North Island of New Zealand. And, you know, in just 200 years, we basically cut them down. Now, ironically, in the context of a climate change challenge, there's now renewed interest in replanting carry trees as a carbon sink because their prodigious size and longevity means they've pretty much the highest carbon absorption potential of pretty much any forest, up to a thousand tonnes of carbon per hectare. But rejuvenating these arboreal titans shouldn't just be about some cold carbon calculation it's about the restoration of some majestic magnificence that should be motivation enough and i think that sort of illustrates the commit or give up quandary as the old proverb says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago the second best time is now if you see that from the perspective of the uk right now with the destruction of ancient forests with the construction of high speed two and as we speak, the destruction of Jones's Hill Wood near Great Missenden in Buckinghamshire hangs in the balance with XR protesters once again up in the branches defending the trees. And that site is famous as the inspiration for local writer Ronald Dahl's fantastic Mr Fox, which we all know and love. And it feels like the imagination of our childhoods is being destroyed with that type of action because 
let's be clear, ancient woodland is not movable or replaceable. When it's gone, it's gone for many human generations, as Tyson Junkerporter suggests. So few of us have now had the privilege to experience ancient, mature, old-growth forests. We can't even comprehend its vitality and importance. I visited Staverton Thicks in Suffolk for the first time with my daughter this summer, and it's a formerly pollarded, millennium-old oak forest a mere stone's throw from where I grew up. Now, I've been lucky to have been to some extraordinary forests around the world, but this place so close to home blew my mind. There's over 4,000 venerable oaks, which are all hundreds of years old, branches twisted like manic tentacles, and they're like ents that have lived through a thousand years of human events. It's only when you see the rare and precious real deal like this that you realise what we've lost. And that shifting baseline syndrome really matters, where every subsequent generation of humanity simply has less idea of what a rich, connected, fecund and biodiverse nature looks and feels like, as the denuded world that they experience is but a shadow of its former self, but is what they consider to be normal. And the concern is, I think, that downward cycle and trajectory continues. You experience less, you connect less, you care less, and ultimately end up losing more. But there is something radically simple and powerful still about defending an old tree or planting a new one, or both. Perhaps that's the epitome of long now thinking. I mean, it's certainly there in the old Greek saying, a society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they shall never sit in. And that term long now is really relevant because it was coined by one of the founding board members of the Long Now Foundation, Brian Eno. And when he moved to New York City, Brian found that here and now meant this room and this five minutes as opposed to the larger here and longer now that he was used to back in England. And their projects, including the clock of the long now, which is currently being constructed in western Texas, it's an enormous clock inside a mountain, are all aimed at trying to stretch out what people consider as now. Uh, And in the words of the clock's inventor, Danny Hillis, he says, I cannot imagine the future, but I care about it. I know I am part of a story that starts long before I can remember and continues long beyond when anyone will remember me. I sense that I am alive at a time of important change and I feel a responsibility to make sure that the change comes out well. I plant my acorns knowing that I will never live to harvest the oaks. I want to build a clock that ticks once a year, the century hand advances once every hundred years and the cuckoo comes out on the millennium. I want the cuckoo to come out every millennium for the next 10,000 years. And I guess I can now synchronously reveal the identity of the famous musician with whom I had the rather serendipitous encounter the other week in Norfolk. Oh, yeah. uh, In regard to the community buyout of my much-loved historical local pub, whose own heritage goes back to the 17th century. And it was, of course, Brian Eno. Ta-da! I I can share that now because actually a piece went out on Anglia TV News last night with Brian being interviewed. But even the challenge of organising a successful community buyout of a pub echoes the forest preservation and restoration i think i've just been describing because once a pub is lost usually through closure change of use or conversion into housing it almost certainly never returns an institution which served people for centuries is effectively gone forever and like a plantation forest as biodiversity offset even the nicest new pub lacks the depth character and complexity of a seasoned old boozer so like an alcoholic clock of the long now the locks in at Gelderston will hopefully still be serving pints of fine local ale in another 300 years, but we can't possibly tell that now. What we can know is that failing to attempt a tricky community buyout now dramatically increases the risk that it almost certainly won't be. I think there's something here that's worth pausing on because we've had this gathering momentum around rewilding and around regenerative agriculture in recent years, not least in relation again to the potential impact for capturing carbon. And we've also had this term of regenerative culture that's been very much lifted up by Extinction Rebellion. And it's one of the distinctive markers of that movement is how seriously it takes that part of the work. And a school called home, we talk about our school as a gathering place and a learning community for those who are drawn to the work of regrowing a living culture. And so I don't think the analogy is at all far-fetched between the ecosystem of the land 
and the cultural ecosystem of the ways that humans live together and the viability of human culture is bound up with it being a way of living with the land. But I think you're absolutely spot on when you make the connection between you know, securing the old growth cultural ecology of a long-standing pub and securing the old growth ecology of a forest, which is not to put them on the same level of importance necessarily, but just to recognise that there really is something and should be something in common between them. Now, I'm going to be honest, I think I like the idea of the pub of the long now more than I like <laughs> the clock of the long now. <laughs> You're a man who loves beer more than time. <laughs> well, you know, time is not a good word in a pub context, in my experience. Time, gentlemen, please. <laughs> but there's something here that goes back to a point that I touched on in the last series, which is about the work of Stuart Brand. Whole Earth was the famous publication that he founded in the 60s that played an absolutely central role in the emergence of the environmental movement and the back to the land movement and tech culture and counterculture and all sorts of things. But at the center of it, this idea of the whole earth was that if we got to see the photograph of the earth from space, then we would appreciate the fragility and precariousness of our situation and it would facilitate a shift to a higher state of collective global consciousness and that story is still doing the rounds. It's still infusing lots of things that I read and listen to today. And I've had a problem with it for a long time, which is I don't think more technology and more distance is necessarily the thing that is called for. And you know, when I hear the idea of the Long Now Foundation, I hear it as the equivalent in time of what whole Earth is in space. I mean, the name for the long now came from your mate, Brian. But the idea from it, as I understand, came from Stuart Brand. And it's very much part of the, the extraordinary portfolio of projects that he has had a hand in. Now, I was a bit rude about Stuart Brand in an essay earlier this year, where I took him and the novelist Ian McEwan to task for presenting a false picture of the climate change debate, basically a picture in which there are you know, reasonable groups on both sides of the debate and irrational, unreasonable groups on both sides of the debate. And that takes out any sense of the power difference between the forces of climate denial, including the very reasonable seeming elements within that versus the fringes of people who go beyond the science on the, the other side of the, the debate. Yeah, that's a bit like uh, Trump saying the good people on both sides. Well, it's a, it's a little bit like that. I'm sure that Stuart Brown won't be happy with us making that comparison. <laughs> but to be, to be fair to him, Alistair McIntosh did draw my essay to Brand's attention on Twitter. And Brand was very friendly and diplomatic and just slightly slippery in his response. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's part of how you get to be Stuart Brand and do all of the things that he's done. There's a great skill of fluidity that's you know I'm, I'm fascinated by brand he is he's a remarkable guy it's hard to think of any one person who connects so many different things and projects in the past 50 years or more one of the less known things one of his earliest projects was this thing that he was taking around to all of the counterculture events on the west coast in the early to mid 60s an installation called America Needs Indians. So one of his early initiatives was attempting to build these connections between indigenous Native American culture and the emerging counterculture. And there's another early glimpse, one of the first places he shows up in the public record in the opening pages of Tom Wolfe's classic 60s counterculture book, The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test where a young Stuart Brand is showing up to meet Ken Kesey out of jail. And here's the description. Wolf writes, A thin, blonde guy with a blazing disc on his forehead and a whole necktie made of Indian beads. No shirt, however, just an Indian bead necktie on bare skin and a white butcher's coat with medals from the King of Sweden on it. And it's worth dwelling on that description because... 
who wears white coats? Well, it's true that butchers wear white coats, but the archetype of the men in white coats, now, apart from the psychiatrist coming to take you away, is the, the <laughs> laboratory scientist. And what is a medal from the King of Sweden? It's literally what you get if you're given a Nobel Prize. So it's kind of disguised in Tom Wolfe's description. I don't know if he's picking up on it, but what I see there is you've got this young figure of Stuart Brand in the epicenter of psychedelia in San Francisco, circa 1963, 64, rocking an outfit that is a conscious fusion of scientist, the white coat, the medals, and indigenous, the Indian bead necktie. And I've taken you down that little digression because I'm convinced that in Brand's mind, the long now concept is a modern translation of seven generation thinking from Native American culture. And I'm equally convinced that there is something important missing from that equation. And there's a very grounded description of seven generations thinking, this idea of making your decisions for seven generations that I came across from Vine Deloria Jr., the Native American writer, theologian, historian, and activist. And he wrote that it's the span of the lived experience of the oldest member of your community. The oldest great-grandmother in your community has held in her arms her great-grandchild and perhaps saw when she was a girl her own great-grandmother. And that is your seven generations. So to think for seven generations is relational. It's embedded within a chain of relations in a way that the satellite's eye view of the whole Earth vision or the 10,000-year thinking that the Long Now Foundation calls for isn't. You know, that 10,000-year thing, the whole Earth thing, has this kind of Silicon Valley hubris to it. The hubris of building a giant clock inside a mountain and imagining that you're going to make it so it's going to tick for the next... 10,000 years. Seven generation thinking is humbler than that. And I find it more trustworthy. And that, that humility and trustworthiness, that's what I find when the braiding of science and indigenous thinking that, you know, Brand, I think, completely sincerely has been expressing the need for since he was a very young man, and he's a very old man now, but still active. I find it in a humbler and more trustworthy form coming from voices like Tyson Junker Porter or Robin Wall Kimmerer in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, where it's coming from people who really know the cost and the complexity and the things that get projected onto you when you speak as an indigenous person who is also operating within a modern scientific or academic or intellectual or cultural context. Yeah, that's that's a great um, description of seventh generation thinking because I I haven't heard it explained that way before, and that gives I think most people make the assumption that it's seven generations hence, but that that historical and future span of intimacy and relation is is much more powerful. But what you're saying about this sort of hyper optimism of some techno utopian thinking, I think that creates a stuck form of tension in itself. You know, where it comes all about the win in which you're inevitably setting yourself up for a fall or a backlash should that not be achieved, which, you know, in all reasonable likelihood, it probably won't be. And it takes me back to when I, you know, co-ran the agency, where there was a sort of slightly hysterical atmosphere we sometimes set up, where we effectively set ourselves up as world saviours. Um, and if we weren't working our asses off and serving our clients the best we could, the world was somehow doomed. That's the opposite of what you're saying in terms of grounded humility. It's actually a dangerous sense of egotistical hubris and arrogance that leads to all sorts of problematic burnout and behaviour. I think you described this a couple of weeks ago, Dougal, that when we try to meet these challenges head on, it's the irresistible force paradox. What happens when an irresistible force meets an immovable object? It actually comes from this, this Chinese notion of contradiction. And there's a third century bc philosophical book where a man is trying to sell a spear and a shield and when asked how good his spear is he says well my spear can pierce any shield and then when asked how good his shield is they say well it can defend from all spear attacks and then one smart ass obviously says what would happen if you take your spear to your shield 
uh, and the seller can't answer. And this led to this Chinese idiom of Xi Xiang Madun. I'm going to pronounce that horribly wrong, but basically self-contradictory. And it, it literally means from each other's spear shield. Yeah, from each other's spear shield, exactly. In that beautiful way that Mandarin can frame. I still think that's where a lot of the Green New Deal, responsible capitalism, ethical consumerism stuff still sits. You know, I I often want to kind of grill my old buddy John Elkington. One of his first books 20 years ago was Cannibals with Forks, you know, in terms of corporate social responsibility and explore where he feels where the tensions lie. Because for me, these things feel like at best contradictions, but at worst, they're sort of logical fallacies. Just to be clear, when you, when you say that, what are you pointing at? Oh, I'm pointing at the kind of the incompatibility of those two positions is, you know, can capitalism ever be responsible? Can consumption ever be truly ethical? You know, is the Green New Deal, which uh, launches this into another round of industrial capitalistic led green energy, going to going to reconcile and resolve our problems right so this kind of vocabulary of things like you know sustainable development is kind of the original of yeah. this it's almost like they're doing the same thing as that chinese term from each other's spear shield putting together two things that are contradictory but without the self-awareness just as a, yeah. a way of papering over the contradiction yeah. Exactly. It's the irresistible force paradox. You know, you know, can capitalism be responsible when inevitably it's about, you know, resource consumption <laughs> and, uh, and, and eternal growth? And maybe my man at the moment, Brian Eno, had it right all along way back in the mid seventies with his oblique strategies cards, which is a deck he produced with the German artist Peter Schmidt to tackle creative blocks. And I think there's something really in this. It certainly seems as Phoebe articulates, we found ourselves in a pretty fundamental creative block on climate. So we're paralysed by a system in which we're complicit and only seemingly able to attempt to transform the system using its own tools and rules. And if that doesn't feel constraining, I don't know what does. And uh, Tyson Younger Porter actually references the old proverb, never wrestle a pig because you both end up covered in shit and the pig likes it. Uh, <laughs> which is a wonderful... That's a good grounded image. For it's you. a very grounded, muddy, earthy image. But the whole point of oblique strategies as i understand it is that introducing another constraint from a randomly shuffled pack of cards should encourage the lateral thinking that may help you get around or over the block and um, and i don't have a copy of the pack they're quite hard to get hold of but there's a few examples that sort of skit around on the internet where you can find people citing some of the cards and i thought that some of these might help us now use an old idea uh Asking what to increase and what to reduce. Well, I mean, that's kind of obvious in terms of climate. Are there sections? Can you consider transitions to honour thy error as a hidden intention, which I, which I, which I particularly like because it creates a sense of reflection on what we might have attempted in the past that we're often um, very loath to do. I particularly love ask your body. Um, work at a different speed which I think we can all have lessons on. And the humbling is inevitably a little bit about a slowing down. Uh, and lastly, gardening, not architecture, which uh, is is encapsulated perfectly in one of my favourite phrases I stumbled upon um, a few years ago, which was building permaculture gardens on cathedral timescales, which always also chimes with what we're saying in terms of this millennium long mission to restore old growth forests and i think those are really beautiful articulations or useful questions that might might guide us what's lovely is they're also pieces of magic i've just finished rereading american gods by neil gaiman and running through the whole thing is the magic of playing with coins and the kind of illusionist skills of moving your attention so you experience the situation differently. And, you know, David Abraham, one of the great sort of ecological philosophers, started out as a sleight of hand magician practicing exactly those skills. And when I hear those cards, I recognize from my own experience working in artistic contexts, it's all about how you unlock something by shifting the attention. And 
listening to you describe the experience of the contradictions and stucknesses within the kind of sustainability world that you've been really at the at the heart of reminds me of the impact that Dark Mountain had for a lot of people. And actually what I was experiencing from Paul's writing that led me to contact him and led us to start Dark Mountain together was this paradoxical sense of release that comes at the point where you let go of the deal, the promise, the idea of saving the world. And uh, that letting go requires you to uh, fall into a surrender, a despair by the terms of the world that you've been operating in. But it is the terms of that world that are why you have been stuck and other things begin to become possible on the far side of that if you don't uh, grasp on too tightly to some new set of terms. And I was wondering, as I listened, whether there's something to be gleaned here from walking in the, the etymological garden of delight that this word tension opens up, because it comes from this Proto-Indo-European root ten, meaning to stretch, with derivatives meaning something stretched, a string, thin. And so tension is the experience of being stretched. It can be appropriate. You think of the tension of a guitar string. I once heard Rowan Williams give a wonderful lecture on poetry and faith where he said, you know, poetry is what happens when you take language and tighten it, bring it to tautness in the way that the string of a guitar is taut so that it can sing. But tension can also be painful and unsustainable. But when you bring it into the garden of words around it, you notice you've got attention. To shift your attention, to give attention to something, is to stretch towards it. The word thin comes from this same root, and through a sense of thinness, meaning vulnerability, you get a sense of something that's young and delicate, which is where the word tender comes from. It's one of those magical double words that weave together almost opposites. So tenderness can mean pain. It can mean soreness. If your skin is tender, and tenderness can mean gentleness, handling somebody with great care. Speaking of weaving, from the same Proto-Indo-European root, you get the word tantra, which isn't just about sex in the way that Westerners often think about it. Tantra is often translated as meaning something like the system, but literally it means the loom or the warp or the weave. And I think of it as a skill in recognizing and working with the fabric of reality, playing with the fabric of reality, my tantric friends would say. And that takes me back to Alistair McIntosh's book, Riders on the Storm, which I talked about last week, because he brings the whole book home with this idea of the need to be held in the basket of community, the warp and the weft. Mm. And he would say that the kind of the Silicon Valley projecting into the future stuff that I was uh, getting provoked by around whole earth and long now and so on, like it's all warp and no weft. And that there may have been times and places where people had the opposite problem, all weft and no warp. But right now, it's, you know, the balance that we need is the weft, the fabrics that go through across the fabric of forward movement and that hold us together. And I think in this beautiful trickiness of language, there might be a clue, especially in these strange words that hold opposite. You know, one of the best ones is the word host and hospitality comes from the same root, but hostility also comes from the same root. You've got these, again, seeming opposites of ways of treating the stranger. And from there, perhaps there's a clue to how we find our way past these blocked, stuck forms of tension that Dan was describing. 
And this is what I do like about Stuart Brand and Brian Eno is this trickster spirit that both of them have. There's a wonderful book by Lewis Hyde called Trickster Makes This World, which is all about the archetype of the trickster in different cultures and the artist as having a particular close relationship to the figure and role of the trickster within modern Western cultures. And one of the things that Hyde talks about is how the trickster is both the inventor of traps and the inventor of oblique strategies, ways of slipping the traps. And I'm convinced that we need that, the life and the energy of trickster as part of the mix, part of the weave right now no that's really beautiful um when you're talking about tantra as well and the the hebridean tantra and the warp and the weft it reminds me because i used to use this in presentations where using the karma sutra uh because people would automatically leap to the assumption that this was some you know naughty giggling western reference to sexual positions but actually it literally means the golden thread that runs through everything let's circle back then to Tyson Junker Porter, maybe, and, and this from the opening chapter of Sand Talk, where he says, The stories that define our thinking today describe an eternal battle between good and evil springing from an originating act of sin. Recent traditions have emerged that break down creation systems like a virus, infecting complex patterns with artificial simplicity and exercising a civilizing control over what some see as chaos. The Sumerians started it. The Romans perfected it. The Anglosphere inherited it. The world is now mired in it. And the war between good and evil is in reality an imposition of stupidity and simplicity over wisdom and complexity. And I read that and I thought, wow, yes, (laughs) there's something that chimed probably longer and louder than the clock of the long now in my mind. Um, And perhaps that's why we experience these states of tension. We find it hard to comprehend that our attempts at control, influence and change might actually be insanely simplistic and indeed even stupid. But nor is the acquiescent opposite stance true. You just do nothing. And I sense similar echoes on climate change. You know, that sort of binary mitigate or adapt, win, lose, commit or give up is actually really unhelpful. Um, and as a climate scientist said to me in Cambridge a few years ago, we can get terrified by future scenarios of anything from two to six degrees or more of climate change to come. But we should never lose sight of the fact that every tonne of carbon we avoid emitting now probably alleviates future human suffering in some way, shape or form in the future. And perhaps the key to transcending commit or give up is to live with the inevitable tension of the different timescales in which we live. As you said right at the start, Dougal, you know, the your inspirations are the, the sources which are helping you shift between those different scales. And riding the tension between perceived success or failure while still acknowledging that every bit matters. Because I think holding the tension of having to actually listen to, attend to and feel into what the world needs is much harder, if wiser, and by its very nature, much more complex work. But it's not impossible. And I'm going to finish on a a slightly irreverent note with a quote from Frankenfurter. Uh, who noted in the song I Can Make You a Man uh, from the Rocky Horror Picture Show, which was one of my teenage influences. Uh, he thinks dynamic tension must be hard work. Such an effort, if you only knew of my plan in just seven days, I can make you a man. And um, Perhaps by living in this dynamic tension, maybe in just seven generations, we can become more human. Thank you for listening to The Great Humbling. We see this podcast as very much an exploration, not a prescription. A provisional investigation that maybe loves questions more than answers to begin with and needs a little time and space to breathe. If you are new to the podcast, please do revisit season one, as we are aiming to build on ideas, insights and narratives already touched upon. And together, this will hopefully enable us all to make a little more sense of these strange times we are living through. Please do comment, ask questions and respond via our Facebook page, The Great Humbling, or via my Twitter account, at Frucal. And we would obviously deeply appreciate and be grateful for any ratings, reviews, recommendations or sharing you might feel compelled to contribute as a result of listening. Our title music is I Recall by Blue Dot Sessions, used gratefully under a Creative Commons licence. We're living in a time of humbling, an initiation at a cultural scale. Please join us on this emergent journey.